What is up guys, Wrestling Premiere is here. In the many shows WWE has given us over the years, for the most part, SmackDown doesn't disappoint. So for this one, we're going to go back to a time where, for the most part, it was fun. If you were like me just watching it, chances are you enjoyed this era of SmackDown. It was on UPN and later on on the CW, and you were chomping at the bit just to see that intro. That's how fun it was. I used to sit and wait until whatever show ended. Not sure, I think everybody loves Raymond, the King of Queens, to watch SmackDown during these years. And they had a very versatile roster. You had strength, you had speed, you had work rate, you had comedy, you had everything. I'm also some it's not as good as the SmackDown 6 era. This is my era. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's probably my favorite era of SmackDown because this is the first era of SmackDown I actually remember. Was it TV that's changing Friday nights? Doubtful, but that doesn't discredit this era of SmackDown. The Friday Night SmackDown was the antithesis of Raw. Monday Night showcased promos for the most part. The matches took a backseat to segments, and yes, there was a memorable match at least once a month on Raw. But compared to SmackDown... Well, the blue brand not only had great matches on Friday nights nearly every single week, but also on Velocity. In this video, I'll cover the SmackDown era from June of 2005 all the way up to May of 2007. Obviously, I'm looking to cover other eras of SmackDown, like from July 2002 to March 2004, April 2009 to April 2010, the epic 2011 to 2012 run, June 2007 to June 2008, yeah, a bunch of eras we can look into. So for right now, let's get into it. But before I do, let me just say, in the coming days, I'm going to show my face, yeah. I don't want to do a cringe face reel. It's cringe in so 2016, and it's just not me. I'll just show you guys a picture of myself in a video, and, and that's it. Like, I'm not going to do some face reveal and epic stuff. No, I'm not doing that. And plus, we're going to change up the content. You know how it is. I mean, there's obviously a big reason as to why I have to show my face. You'll understand later on, though. So yeah. Anyways, let's get into it. Friday Night Smackdown. This era. I have so many memories of it. Kali destroying Rey Mysterio, Eminem in general, Lundrick and Ashley, Randy Orton ramming Eddie Guerrero's lowrider into the Smackdown set with the Undertaker on the back, although that was messed up. So many stuff. Now, from a small time period, about eight months if I remember correctly, I didn't get the chance to watch Raw, so I watched Smackdown. That's all I watched. And obviously, I wished to see John Cena, but it didn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. The whole roster, it was awesome. Why? Well, let me mention some of the things from this era of SmackDown. First up, let's mention Randy Orton. This guy during this era, he was a really big punk. With his father at his side, Orton had the gel and spiked up hair. He was arrogant without a worry in the world until The Undertaker shows up. He was really detestable in his programs with The Undertaker and Ray and Angle were really fun. And they showed just how far Randy Orton would go in order to inflict damage on his opponent. The fact that he set a casket on fire containing The Undertaker and ramming Eddie Guerrero's lowrider to the SmackDown set showed that, like, it was heartless. Not only inflict pain physically, but mentally too. He literally told Ray that Eddie's in hell. Once again, that was messed up. He was disrespectful, and whatever he got his come off into, you enjoyed it. Obviously, Randy Orton's time on the blue brand was kind of short, but in his time on Friday nights, Randy Orton managed to make a big impact. As for his best televised match, it was, well this is my opinion, it's for me, it's my favorite, it's not the best one. There's another match that was way better than this one, this is my favorite. Randy Orton versus Rey Mysterio on the SmackDown after WrestleMania. I really enjoy this match, why? Well, Rey once again shuts up Randy Orton proving he ain't a fluke. The action was pretty good and all in all it's one of the best SmackDown matches from this era. The Legend Killer's run on SmackDown showed that he had a very twisted and vicious side to him. So yeah, it was memorable. But, could it have been better? Maybe, but Orin himself squandered any chance of it being more than it was. Moving on from the Legend Killer, I want to focus on the more bizarre side of SmackDown. Now, were these things good? Well, it depends on your opinion. You guys remember the Dicks. These guys were probably the worst tag team ever. I don't remember any memorable segment featuring these two. Their gimmick? Well, I don't even know what the hell it was. Bodybuilders? WBF wannabes? I'm not sure. But from what I saw, they spray water or baby oil on each other, and that's all. They didn't even last that long, and within three or four months, they got released. As for how they got released, I don't know if you knew this, but if you did, please comment down below. Story goes in credit to Armpit Wrestling. Tank and Chad were being hazed and ribbed by JBL, since they were newcomers. Chad, I believe, talked back to JBL or something like that, and so he was sent to wrestler's court. So many of the wrestlers, The Undertaker, Chris Benoit, JBL, they were all in the bathroom, right? Well, Chad had this bright idea of locking all of them in there due to how terrified he was. Once they confronted him about it, they laughed it off. But then news got to them that Chad cried to Tank about it and the ribbing was back on the menu. Anyways, Tank was lumped in with Chad and this annoyed him, so they fought in front of a bunch of wrestlers and this resulted in Tank needing stitches on his hand and Chad busting his lip. Eventually they got released and I'm not sure if it was due to the fight, but they were gone a month later. Vince liked their bodies, but they were too short I guess. No pun intended. Another weird thing to occur during this era of SmackDown was the Gemini. Now these guys, I don't remember them on TV, but I bet you know them from the toy aisle at Walmart. I don't remember seeing these guys on TV. As for their toys, I feel bad if you purchased them. 
That's the joke on the internet, and yes, I didn't care to buy these guys' toys back then. Same goes for this May Young toy. I saw it for over a year at retail, and I refused to buy it. Like, what am I supposed to do with that toy? Anyways, Paul London and Brian Kendrick made them look like a million bucks, but they weren't seen afterwards. Like, a couple of weeks into their run, one of them got injured, and then they were released. Now seriously, these ruthless aggression call-ups were so damn forgettable. Like, you guys know those guys that just come from OVW, wherever the hell they came from? They debut, they have an underwhelming run, and they disappear. They were great value Goldberg and Stone Cold, or even great value Basham Brothers. Like, uh, what's there to enjoy? Maybe, maybe they would've proved everyone wrong, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, but in their time they're like, forgettable. Before I move on to better things that we actually enjoyed or remember, I have to mention the juniors division. This thing was so damn unsuccessful, you had Porky Boy, or I forgot what the hell his name was, they had Mr. Kennedy's brother there, they had El Torito's precursor, they had a bunch of guys they signed, and they decided to have a juniors division. Now, originally, this wasn't even the plan. In 2005, WWE is looking to take the Cruiserweight division and make it a very serious division. But Big Johnny preferred to have this atrocity. Shortly afterwards, it was scrapped, and I don't know what he was thinking. It was a whole, it was a bad idea in itself, and they were relegated to Velocity only a couple of weeks into their run. Anyways, after the Juniors division, WWE hired Dylan Postal, and he was used in a recurring role as Finley's little bastard. That's what they called him too. Moving on from the bad stuff, and yes there's more, but this isn't a why Smackdown sucked in 2005 video, because it's actually good. There was some stuff that just happened during this era, like every other era, like everyone says Attitude Era is the best era, but obviously there's some bad stuff there. Doesn't matter, but in the grand scheme of things it was actually good. Now moving on, a very great thing to happen during this era of Smackdown was Finley. As you may know, F Finley was best known for wrestling in WCW. When he was signed with the WWE, he took the role of an agent. It wasn't until 2006 when he finally returned to the ring. As for his character, well, it's, it was simple. His name was Finley, and he loved to fight. Now, why was Finley's arrival to SmackDown so good? Well, he brought with him a rough style of wrestling that gave us some really stiff matches against the likes of William Regal and Chris Benoit. And this tactic, like, I'd never seen that before Finley. It was as unorthodox as you could get. Overall, Finley was a very resourceful tool during this era of SmackDown, and I can't stress it enough. It was like he became the engine of Friday Night SmackDown once he debuted. It was a very valuable asset. He gets in there, puts over talent, makes them look good in the process without becoming an afterthought himself. So yeah, Finley, bright spot of SmackDown during this era. Next up, these gimmicks just came out of the blue, and like, they're unexpected, basically. You're like, what? First up, Paul Burchill. What was up with him? He was a serious wrestler before this. Like, he teamed up with William Regal and all that, and all of a sudden he decided to become Jack Sparrow. He claimed his ancestors were pirates, his entrance was the goofiest yet coolest thing on SmackDown, and within a couple of weeks he got over on the show. The fans digged it, they really loved it, and no, I'm not over-exaggerating, but Vince decided to nix the whole thing. Why? Well, a couple of things. First of all, Vince, we don't know what goes through his head. And second, this was basically a Jack Sparrow ripoff. I believe Disney sent a cease and desist letter. Looking back, yeah, I can see why. <laughs> it's clear as day. I mean, I don't think you have to look back. You just think of yourself in 2006, you're like, hey, isn't he Jack Sparrow? Looking back, Burchell's doing some ridiculous stuff in and outside of WWE, and it's a shame he never got some kind of push. Like, I personally believe he was capable of holding the US title. So, yeah. Pirate Burchill, I like him. I like him, but he wasn't expected to win a title. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, another memorable or unmemorable gimmick from this time period was Vito wearing a dress. Before this, and this is Nunzio's words, it was a tough Italian stallion. One night, Orlando Jordan approached Nunzio, his tag partner, and told him that he'd seen a guy that looked exactly like Vito dressed in a skirt. Nunzio didn't believe it because this guy, like... He wasn't even close to what Jordan depicted him as. He was this guy that was hanging out with girls, wearing the suits, the sunglasses, all that stuff. And you're telling me he's wearing a dress? Then Paul Burchell tells Nunzio about how he saw Vito wearing a skirt. Once again, Nunzio didn't believe this. Over the next couple of weeks, Vito denied any of these accusations, but then Nunzio felt like these rumors were getting to his head. Eventually, he believed the entire roster, and there he was. Vito, he didn't give a damn about these rumors. He embraced it, and he was the same Vito as before, except this time around, he wore a dress. That's all. Like, Vito, he wanted to hang out with Ashley and all the girls and stuff like that. He just wanted to wear a dress. That's all. That's all that's different. Anyways, Vito's run was so random, but it sticks out to me due to the gimmick he had. Oh, and he was in SVR 2007 too. Oh, and who remembers Sylvain promoting Quebec? 
Anyways, moving on, I gotta mention this guy, the Boogeyman. He was the most mysterious wrestler on the roster, and the problem with him was the fact that his gimmick was gonna have a ceiling over it. He wasn't expected to win a title, and to add to the fact that he was 40, it didn't help him. He was given a somewhat moderate push beating JBL and then Booker T at WrestleMania, but then he disappeared. Why? Well, he tore his biceps, and in his time away, he got released from WWE only to be re-signed two weeks later. Upon his return to SmackDown, he was paired with Little Boogeyman to feud with Finley and Hornswoggle. They gave us a 5-star classic at No Way Out, and all in all, Boogeyman's run, just like his character, was bizarre. Maybe I'll try to cover it in a future video, but yeah. Boogeyman, weird ass run, like I don't even get what they were trying to do with him, and plus he was screwed the moment it started because of the gimmick. Moving on, and I almost forgot about this guy, but I like him. Shimmy Wang Yang. His character was an Asian redneck, and that's simple as that. As random as that may sound, Jimmy was all in on the character, and I believe he was the one who pitched the character to Vince. Or did he? Not sure. Inside the ring, it's well known that Wang Yang was great. He had some entertaining cruiserweight matches against the likes of Gregory Helms and Chavo Guerrero, and I do believe he was cruiserweight championship material, but it was never to be. Will I make a bonus video on him? Hell yeah! Damn right. Jimmy Wang Yang, we gotta talk about him. No one talks about this guy. He's awesome. Alright, that's enough of these random characters. Now let's focus on the actual good stuff, the stuff we still talk about to this day. First up... Eddie Guerrero. During the SmackDown run, Latino Heat was a heel, albeit a heartless heel, but at times he was hilarious, like the stomach issues, all that stuff. His feud with Rey Mysterio was off the rails, and yes, I'm looking to cover it. I'm just trying to watch their WCW run to cover that stuff as well, and yeah. Anyways, Eddie managed to get the entire crowd on Rey Mysterio's side during the feud, and if it was anyone else in Eddie's position, this feud may have sucked. Then he had that program with Batista, which turned him to a babyface. And overall, Latino Heat during the SmackDown run managed to regain that fire and passion he had from two years earlier. It really established Eddie as the number two at times number one heel on SmackDown, and so it was definitely a highlight of his career. It's just a shame it ended right before we got a conclusion. Rumor has it was gonna turn heel once again and feud with H3K at WrestleMania 22, but it never happened. Moving on, I gotta mention this guy. Now, many aren't really big fans of Bobby Lashley's first run in WWE, but obviously as a kid, I liked him. Do I like him now? Yeah! Looking back, he may have debuted a bit too soon. I believe Jim Cornette tried hiding him from Vince in Developmental, and that story gets a laugh out of me every time. The fact they're trying to hide someone so big from Vince, it wasn't gonna work out for them. Now, the most memorable stuff from Lashley's run on SmackDown, well, for me, it was when he tried flipping a car with Finley on top of it. Like, this moment was so absurd and hilarious. The security guards are trying to tell him, don't do it, and stuff like that. It was so intense, yet funny at the same time. <laughs> But what it also showed was that Lashley in WWE's eyes was the real deal. If you flip a car in WWE, it means you're gonna be a tough guy, I guess. I mean, Braun Strowman does it all the time. Big Show did it. Did Mark Henry do it? I feel like he did. Then there's this moment. If you know it well, you get why I mentioned it. But if you don't well, here it is. I say your name is Finley, and you're a ba bastard. Seriously, though, I seem to recall Lashley's moments with Vince... That feud on ECW and Raw, more than a SmackDown run, but yes, he was decent, he showed flashes, that's what I'm trying to say, and WWE was right in trying to push him, I believe he was certainly capable of being a big star. Moving on, let me mention two of the most annoying guys during this era of SmackDown. First up, Mr. Kennedy. Looking back, everyone thought this guy was the future world champion, I mean he had the mic skills, he could work in the ring in a way, he had the character and he had the backing of management, so all was good for Ken Kennedy in world wrestling entertainment. I don't think anyone doubted that he's a future world champion, I mean, you don't feud with guys like The Undertaker and Batista back to back if you're not a future main eventer. He was a fun character on SmackDown, he's shouting at Tony Chimmel, his feud with The Undertaker was really good in my opinion, so yeah, I say Mr. Kennedy was a bright spot. As for the next guy, it was Montel Vontavious Porter. This guy was pushed right out of the gate. He had the charisma and my skills. And it took him a while to show what he's capable of in the ring, but those two things were good enough for him initially. Like I said in a previous video, once he got to feud with Benoit, everything changed for him. In my opinion, MVP was definitely a good thing to happen to SmackDown in this era. My next mention might be controversial, but at the time, he was definitely one of the best things on SmackDown. I'm talking about Chris Benoit. During his run, he was always one of the elite, like his feuds and programs, they were always one of the best things on the show. For example, say nothing's happening on SmackDown today, well hey, we can look forward to whatever Chris Benoit's doing, that's what I'm trying to say right now. His feud with Booker T was really fun, and yes, those matches weren't as good as the WCW ones, but they were still good, and I almost forgot about the Randy Orton matches. Those were really outstanding, and if you do watch Benoit's matches, then these series of matches are a must-watch. 
his feud with Chavo, the matches were good, but the only negative I had with that was the fact that they had to drag Eddie into it. But for the matches, once again, great. Their Armageddon bout was pretty entertaining. Benoit had other matches against William Regal and Finley. They were rough and vicious and stiff. And those MVP matches really played a part in helping Montel grow as an in-ring performer. All in all, this Chris Benoit run solidified him as one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, if he wasn't already. It can be seen as the same way it was, though. But yeah, like I said, at the time, it was really great. Chris Benoit, ring general, one of the best on SmackDown during this era. Now, let me give you some honorable mentions. Eminem. These guys made themselves very comfortable on the blue brand. They had just debuted, yet they were a focal point of the show immediately. Their characters, well, they were A-listers, I guess. To put it simply, they were bougie. The titles were dangling from their freaking pants. Their characters were on point. They were pretty good in the ring. And all in all, for me, they were one of the most memorable teams to come from the Ruthless Aggression era. I will definitely make something on them in the future, so expect that one soon. Next up, Lundrick. These two, man, they were so fun and exciting to watch. I personally believe they were ahead of their time. Like, had they debuted a couple of years later, maybe they would have gotten a much better push. But yes, Paul London and Brian Kendrick were utilizing some unorthodox offense, like that dropkick moonsault, a bunch of other stuff. And if you want more on that duo, check out this video. Moving on, I gotta mention Booker T. The fact that Booker was given what was essentially a mid-carder gimmick and made it work it's a testament to his ability. It wasn't his normal character that got him a world title in WWE, but it was freaking King Booker. This run was kind of goofy, it was hilarious, and yes, Booker wasn't as serious a threat at times, but by the looks of it, he was a heat magnet, and I despised him at the time as a kid. Whenever he battled the likes of John Cena or Batista or Lashley, like, damn, I hated him. He was probably the second most hated on the roster after Edge for me at the time. Once again, I already made something on his entire run, but long story short, King Booker was entertaining. It didn't matter if he was or wasn't champion, he was fun. The See No Evil parody thing was hilarious. What can I say? King Booker, bright spot of his career, and, and I almost forgot about this individual, but during this era of SmackDown, things finally clicked for him. I'm talking about Mark Henry. After nearly 10 years with the company, it didn't seem like Henry was a seasoned vet. He always got injured and he always got sent back down to OBW. Upon his return, he was finally booked to be the unstoppable force. It took them, and himself, nine and a half years to figure out things. And yes, he did get injured in July of 2006, but once he returned, he was never on the shelf. Plus, this was the run which saw Mark Henry get that awesome theme song by 3-6 Mafia. It's one of the best theme songs in wrestling. It fit him right to a T. Somebody's gonna get their ass kicked. Somebody's gonna get their wig split. All that stuff. Awesome, awesome. And yes, like I said, Mark Henry finally got things right around this time period. Now, I didn't forget about that poll. I just gotta mention it right now. I just prefer to save it till next week, that's all. Okay, I have to mention the Cruiserweight division and the one man that put that division right on his back. Now, the Cruiserweights during this era of SmackDown, they were slowly starting to fade away. But that didn't mean they became an afterthought. It's just less Cruiserweight matches were happening. Guys like Kid Cash, Juventud Guerrera, and Nunzio had their moments to shine. And yes, the matches were pretty good, but they were usually overshadowed by whatever there was on the show. But then... There's one guy that came from out of nowhere and became a somewhat notable, scratch that, not somewhat, he was a notable part of the show. I'm talking about Gregory Helms. In early 2006, Gregory Helms from out of nowhere won the Cruiserweight Championship. His run with the title, it was fun. Not necessarily because of the Cruiserweight title defenses, but because of the matches he had with everyone on SmackDown. It didn't matter if it was super crazy, The Undertaker or Batista, he made the most out of the opportunity he was given, he sold for that guy, and basically, if he had time, he was gonna have a good match. Seeing as you guys actually do want the video, yes, Gregory Helms is coming real soon. Next up, Kurt Angle, the wrestling machine, one of the most dominant championship runs in recent memory. Kurt Angle stepped up to the challenge of leading SmackDown into WrestleMania, and he did a pretty damn good job at it. I cannot stress the fact that Kurt Angle 2006, he was probably the best wrestler in the world. It's just a shame that this title run was short, but that's what probably makes it so amazing. Another guy to really shine during this era of SmackDown was The Undertaker. As you may know, after he returned as the dead man, he was placed in some not-so-great feuds. When he finally feuded with Randy Orton and became best pure striker Undertaker, that was it. No one was gonna stop him. Sure, there were some bumps on the road, but The Undertaker wasn't gonna let that get in his way. He got in the best shape of his career, his feud with Kennedy was enjoyable for me, and the fact that the Brothers of Destruction reformed during this time period was awesome. Like I said, The Undertaker had this drive, will, passion, determination, which probably wasn't even seen at any point in his career up until 2005. Next up, Rey Mysterio. Damn! Most likable guy on the roster for me. You couldn't go against him in the Eddie feud. He was one of the only guys that could pull off the pure good guy character in this era. And sure, his push was as a result of Eddie's unfortunate death. But Rey, regardless, deserved to hold that title. 
Yeah, his title reign was another story, but for the most part, he delivered in his matches. Minus the squash ones. After losing the title, he was placed in this feud with Chavo, and it was about Eddie once again. Like, it was bad enough they used Eddie in Ray and Randy stories, and they didn't get the memo at this point. But, on the bright side, that I Quit match was really brutal. I remember that one vividly. Ray hanging from the SmackDown Steel support on the stage, while Chavo was delivering some remorseless, some vicious chair shots. Despite some awkward booking, Ray remained one of the very best on the blue brand. So for me, he's either number two or number three in this era. And lastly, I'd like to mention Batista. This guy was the man. If you were like me, chances are your favorite on SmackDown was Batista. He had this intensity to him that was just captivating. Now, yes, after his return from injury, he was rusty and it took him time to find form. But when he did, it was great and he was even better than he previously was. 2007 Batista was peak babyface Batista for me. He had some good matches against Kennedy, Taker, and Edge. So yes, my favorite from this era was Batista. Now, SmackDown overall, there was obviously some hiccups here and there. For the most part, the feuds, the matches, they were good. And for that, I'd say SmackDown 2005 to 2007 is probably my favorite era of this show. Now, yes, I obviously forgot or didn't mention some stuff. But, uh, yeah, like, I got most of the stuff there. We got Gregory Helms. We'll cover him soon. We got Batista. We got Rey Mysterio. We got everything in there. Now, if whatever you guys want, just please comment down below which era you want. So, yeah. Overall, SmackDown 2005-2007, a golden era in a way. It obviously wasn't perfect, as expected. But mostly, everything clicked. Everything was right there. Everyone belonged where they did. That's it for this video. Make sure you hit a Batista bomb on the like button and perhaps a shiny wizard on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.